So please welcome Dr. Kirk. Thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, introduction. Thanks to the Mitsui Foundation for honoring me as, as uh, the latest in a very distinguished lecture series. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thanks, too, to uh, John Carroll University, to, to the faculty who have gone above and beyond in their hospitality and, and uh, stimulating conversation, uh, to uh, Professor Nakano and, and Dr. Purdy in particular. Uh, also to uh, people who work behind the scenes, like Brenda, who have made all of this possible. Uh, but, but also thanks to, to the students. I've had a, a really interesting time interacting with uh, students. We had some interesting conversation over lunch about North Korea. I was able to peruse some of the, the posters out here and also go to one of the afternoon sessions of, of the Celebration of Scholarship, and, and I'm, I'm extremely impressed. Uh, John Carroll University students are, are, are first rate, and it's, it's really been a pleasure to, to interact with you a little bit. Uh, what I want to do tonight is tell a couple of stories. That's what historians do sometimes. Uh, stories that if you have been a, a scholar or a student of Korean history, you might have heard about. Uh, if you've not, the chances are pretty good you've never heard these stories. Uh, and I want to show a little bit of the historical method in action, uh, how historians try to sift through the available evidence and determine as best as possible what really happened in the past, but also pay close attention to what people say, think, or believe, or remember, or imagine about what happened regardless of, of, of the actual veracity of these memories. Uh, and I think both of these are very important in understanding how these, these particular events have shaped Korean identity, both North and South, but, but also the perceptions of, of relations between Korea and the United States. The first story I want to tell is a story that's often told in, in, in Korea as the beginning, the starting point of relations between Korea and the United States. And that's an event that took place in 1866 called the General Sherman Incident. And then the second story is one that happens five years later. Uh, then it has some different names. Uh, in, in the United States, in English, it's often known as the Low Rogers Expedition. Uh, in Korean, it's sometimes known as the Shimin Yangyo, the Western Disturbance of 1871. Uh, but sometimes in Korean, it's also known as the First Korean-American War. Uh, and so I want to sort of unpack both of these a little bit. Uh, but first, when we talk about beginnings, when we talk about origins, obviously beginning is, is an important part of a story. Uh, it gives us a, a, a framework to, to begin with, a point to start our narrative with. It also sets the tone for, for, for what happens next. And I want to share two quick vignettes about how I had discussions about the beginnings of Korean-American relations with two different individuals or groups to sort of highlight how different these perceptions can be and, and, and the importance of it. So the first, and both of these took place about 15 years ago, the first vignette uh, was with a group of Americans. Uh, and in fact, it was a group of diplomats at the State Department. And I asked them the question, I was asked to, to lecture to the folks at the Korea desk about history and about how history might matter in, in uh, shaping contemporary affairs. And I asked them, based on your knowledge, your memory, when and under what conditions did relations between Korea and the United States begin? And the first response was silence. You could hear the crickets chirping. Uh, but then finally, one, one gentleman raised his hand and said, well, didn't, didn't we sign a treaty in 1883? Is, is, isn't that how it began? And I said, yeah, pretty close. The treaty was negotiated in 80, 1882, but signed in 1883, you know, close enough. So that was one, one answer. Uh, and then it just so happened that about 10 days later, I happened to be in New York City, where I got to hear a very different view on this uh, from North Korea. Uh, it was actually from this individual, Han Sung Yul, who at the time was part of the, the North Korean delegation to the United Nations. And he gave a speech. And in this speech, he referred to 150 years of enmity that have characterized relations between Korea and the United States. And so, of course, my historian's ears pricked up, and I got a chance to go ask him a question afterwards. And I said, uh, you know, Mr. Han, I, I heard you talk about 150 years of enmity. I'm very curious, in your estimation, how did this begin, or when did this begin? Uh, and there were no crickets chirping. He, he immediately said, the General Sherman incident, 1866, everybody knows that. You know, th th this is how it began. And so this really got me thinking about, uh, the, again, the divergent ways that, that the same event can be remembered or not remembered uh, and, and, and the impact that it can have. So first, let's, let, let's unpack this incident a little bit. Uh, and note that if we're going to be technical, uh, this might not have been the first interaction between Koreans and Americans. As far as we can tell, the first documented case where Americans interacted, met Koreans, set foot on Korean soil, happened a decade before, in, in uh, 1855 when four crewmen of, of an American whaling ship called the Two Brothers uh, 
were so, uh, they, they, they didn't like the treatment that their captain was, was dishing out to them, and so they stole one of the smaller boats and, and left. And they tried to sail to Japan, but the winds blew them in the opposite direction. The winds blew them to Korea. They landed on the east coast of Korea. They were met by local Koreans there who gave them food and provisions, but, all, but also did what Koreans typically do with shipwrecked victims. They said, we, we want to get you out of our country as quickly as possible. And so they, they hustled them to the, the Chinese border and handed them over to China. Uh, ultimately, they, they made their way down to Shanghai, where there, were, where there was an American consul. He interviewed them. How did you get here? What, what, you know, tell me your story. And, and, and they told him their, their, the story, but uh, the, the interview record is so scanty that, that actually one, uh, one historian who's looked at this particular moment concluded that uh, they were inarticulate, quite possibly illiterate. They left only the bare account of their travels. And so this raises sort of the uh, 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 historical analog to the philosophical question, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it really make a sound? If Americans set foot on Korean soil, but they are so unaware of what they're doing or where they are, does it really count? You know, is this really the first part, you know, the first moment of Korean-American relations? And most would conclude, no, this, this, this doesn't really count. But interestingly, in the same year as the General Sherman incident, but, but a little bit before, there's another event that if this were taken as the beginning of Korean-American relations, it would have a very different sort of tone, a very different sort of story. Uh, this is a story of an American merchant ship called the Surprise, which shipwrecked on the other coast of Korea, the, the, the western coast. Uh, but similar to the four uh, uh, whaling ship sailors, uh, they were hospitably treated, they were given food and provisions, and then hustled off to the border to China, just, just like before. And they noted that their treatment at the hands of the Koreans was much kinder, much more generous than it was once they crossed the border into China. The Chinese actually treated them pretty poorly. And at one point they said, well, you know, we're dying of thirst and they won't let us have any water. Uh, and, and one observer of, of this particular uh, interaction said that uh, you know, the crew was, was treated with more respect uh, than, than they could have expected in any civilized country. Uh, you know, they were treated really, really well. And in fact, the United States, a year later, sent a letter to the king of Korea about this incident, in which, he, uh, which it says, the whole American people cannot but feel thankful uh, and praise your nation for this act of kindness and brotherly love. Now again, if you imagine, if, if this was taken as the beginning of Korean-American relations, things start off really well, uh, of, of you know, hospitable treatment, of kindness, of, of mutual respect, and so on. But for various reasons, this story too has largely been forgotten, uh, even, even in Korea. And instead, we have the story of the General Sherman. Uh, this too is an American merchant ship. Uh, but unlike the other ones, this story ends in violence and bloodshed and death. Uh, to, to, to make a long story short, and then we'll go back and unpack it a little bit more, the General Sherman sailed up the Taedong River, the river leading to modern day Pyongyang. Uh, and when they reached the outskirts of, of Pyongyang, they had a number of unfortunate encounters with, with Koreans on the shore. And the upshot of it is the, the, the Koreans rose up in a mass, they attacked the ship, they burned it, and they killed everyone on board. And so a very different sort of, of, of beginning. Uh, but there's some interesting aspects about this that, that, that again, I think uh, illustrate the, 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 uh, the diverging ways that, that, that people remember things. And it's very clear that if you, if you look at this ship and, and what it thought it was doing and who was on board and so on, there, there are all sorts of reasons to conclude that it wasn't an American ship at all. Uh, in fact, you could, you, you could say that, that you know, very clearly the General Sherman was dispatched not by Americans, but actually by British. Uh, there was a British merchant by the name of Jonathan Meadows who uh, had been doing a business that he called very nicely Meadows and Company after himself, uh, that had, uh, had been doing a thriving business on, in, in the treaty ports in China in, in the 1860s. Uh, and, and we have, you know, you can sort of pour through the various uh, records and, 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 and things in China to, to find evidence of, of, of his activity. Uh, but he teamed up with his brother, Thomas Meadows, who was a British diplomat, and it was, it was at that time stationed in, at the port city in China closest to the Korean border, a place called Nyochuang. And the two Meadows brothers were convinced that Korea needed to open itself up to the outside world to trade, and that a lot of money could be made if, if, if this were to happen, and that Great Britain was the power to do it. And so they wrote editorials in British newspapers saying, you know, the British government should pay attention to Korea, it should send a, a, a diplomat to open up Korea, we, we can, there, there's lots of commercial opportunities here. Uh, but the British government didn't seem to be very interested. And so the Meadows brothers figured, we, well, we need to demonstrate to everyone how much money can be made. And so they chartered a ship, and they, they, uh, they sent it from Tianjin to the, the nearby treaty port of, of Jerfu, or Chifu, uh, where, where they, they uh, got together a crew, and, and they, they loaded the ship with a bunch of goods that they thought they could trade in Korea to show that they could make a lot of money, and then off, uh, uh, oops, wrong way, sorry, across the Yellow Sea they went. And so this, this very clearly is, and you know, there's no Americans in this part of the story at all. And interestingly, when they got to Jerfu, 
and loaded up their crew. Uh, there were two British on, on board, but the majority of the crew were Chinese. Uh, and this, this was not uh, the first time that Chinese had sailed near the western coast of Korea. In fact, Chinese fishermen and, and traders and smugglers were well known on the coast. Uh, they, they weren't always welcomed by the, by the Koreans, but, but uh, the, the Koreans were more than familiar with, with Chinese ships showing up and, and offering to trade goods and so on. And so if you're just counting by the sheer number of crew members, you might come away saying this, this is a Chinese venture. It, it's not an American one. And in fact, accompanying the General Sherman for, for the first part of its journey were, were three additional Chinese junks, three, three Chinese ships that were staffed by well-known uh, smugglers, people that had done a lot of business on the coast of Korea for, for a long time. But when the General Sherman started to do something that the smuggling ships didn't do, then things started to diverge. Uh, it didn't stay just on the coast, where you could drop anchor, you could trade with, with anyone that, that was interested, but then you could raise anchor and run away if, if uh, the authorities showed up. Uh, but the General Sherman started to work its way up the Taedong River. And when they reached this critical point, the, the, the so-called rushing waters gate, or the Gupsumun, uh, it was very clear then that the General Sherman was doing something a little bit different. It wasn't just going to engage in smuggling. It was, it was going to head up river in a way that would be much more difficult to turn around and run if, if, if trouble arose. And at that point, the three Chinese junks left. They said, we're, we're not going to be part of this anymore. But the 18 members of, of the Chinese crew stayed on board. Uh, then, and oh, and here, here's a, a, a contemporary Korean map that shows the same thing, that, you know, this critical spot, the, the, the rushing waters gate, where you're no longer in the ocean, you're really heading up a river, and, 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 it, and it makes it a very different sort of venture. As the ship made its way up the river, it encountered any number of local Korean officials, and these uh, officials tried to communicate with the people on board. They often wrote in classical Chinese to the Chinese crew that, 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 that could read it. And they also mentioned that there was one individual on board that seemed to be able to speak a little Korean, though in many cases they couldn't really understand what he was saying. Uh, but but they, they, they report up the line to, to the central government in Seoul that, yes, this strange ship keeps sailing up the Taedong River. And we meet it and we, we explain to them, your presence here is illegal. You, you, you shouldn't be here. And, and, and they say, you know, the people on the General Sherman say, we want to trade. And, and the officials say, but we reported to them, that's against the law. We're, we're, we're not going to allow any trade. There's no money to be made here. Please, please turn around and go home. Uh, but the General Sherman ignored it. They kept sailing up the river despite these, these, these multiple reports of, of, of local Korean officials warning them. Uh, but interestingly, the, these reports of local officials neglected to note that the guy that they sometimes tried to communicate speaking Korean uh, this guy, Robert Jermaine Thomas, was a, a Welsh missionary, uh, and, and he was coming to Korea on behalf of the London Missionary Society. Uh, he had snuck into Korea the year before and spent about six weeks there. He learned a little Korean, and so when he heard about the ship, the General Sherman, that was going to go back to Korea, he volunteered to, to uh, join the expedition as interpreter. But his account, or, or the account of Korean Protestant Christians, is that every single time the General Sherman stopped on its way up the river, he would get on shore and he would pass out Bibles and he would pass out missionary tracts and hundreds and sometimes thousands of people would come and gather and listen to what he had to say. The Korean officials reported about none of this because they knew they'd be in big trouble if they, were, if they acknowledged that these kinds of things were happening with, with, within their jurisdiction. But here we have yet another sort of way to understand this mission. You know, not, not a British commercial one, not a Chinese smuggling one, but a Western missionary mission. Uh, and, and uh, another way to sort of think about this. But so far, we haven't heard anything about the Americans. So how, how does this get associated with the United States? Well, the fact of the matter is the owner of the ship, a guy by the name of William Ballard Preston, was an American. And he, he decided to, to accompany the expedition on board. And in addition, two of the crew, a Mr. Page and a Mr. Wilson, were probably also Americans. And, and, and so there were three Americans on board. But interestingly, all of the Korean accounts that I've read about encounters with the ship at most, they list that, yes, these guys were on board and, and, and they come from a place that they call Miguk or, or, or the United States. Uh, but none of them credit him with being the head of the expedition. None of them talk about negotiating directly with him or, or in, in any other way indicate that he was in charge. Uh, but nonetheless, subsequent generations of, of, of Koreans and Korean historians have, have basically forgotten the possibility that this could be regarded as a British commercial adventure or a Western Christianizing adventure or a Chinese smuggling one. And all they do is focus on sort of the American start of the story. So ultimately, the ship reaches Pyongyang, or the outskirts of modern-day Pyongyang. And then a series of events happen that we, we don't have quite a, a clear grasp of the chronology because the Korean reports differ a little bit. But, but we, know, we know the following probably happened. At one point, the ship runs aground on a sandbar in the middle of, 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 the, of the river. And so it's stuck. 
And at, and at some point, the ship sends some of its crew on to shore, perhaps maybe to get water or supplies or other things. Uh, but, but things don't turn out very well because there are accounts then of some of the crew assaulting women. Uh, there are accounts of the, the Koreans sending a, a local official to the General Sherman to again say, what are you doing, please go away. And instead of just simply ignoring him, in this case, the crew of the General Sherman capture him and hold him hostage and refuse to give him up. Uh, there are accounts of the General Sherman actually firing on people on the shore and killing seven. Uh, and, and, and again, we're, we're not, you know, we only have one side of the story at this point. We only have the Korean side of the story because all, all the crewmen of, of the ship were killed. Uh, but, but we have a sense that you know, there are a lot of conflicts going on between, between the crew and, and uh, uh, the Koreans on shore. Ultimately, the governor general of Pyongan province that, that this takes place in, uh, a guy by the name Pak Yusu, memorializes to the Korean throne and basically says, the, the, these, these guys won't listen to reason, they won't turn around and go home, they're doing all these terrible things, they're killing our Korean, our, our Korean people, shouldn't they be utterly destroyed? And the throne said, do it. And so Pak did it. Uh, he got together a group of soldiers and civilians. Uh, first, they tried to, from the shore, fire arrows and throw rocks and things at the ship that wasn't very effective. But ultimately, they resorted to fire ships, a bunch of small boats that they loaded with wood. They set them on fire, sailed it toward the, the General Sherman, and ultimately one of these succeeded in catching the ship on fire. And by accounts of Koreans, it exploded. Most of the people on board died immediately. A few drowned in the water nearby. And ultimately, only two were able to dive off and swim to shore. One Chinese crewman and, and Reverend Thomas. Uh, and uh, they were met by a crowd of angry Koreans, and they were beaten and immediately beheaded. Uh, on shore. Uh, now, Protestant lore has it that, that Reverend Thomas, to the very end, was handing out Bibles left and right, and that he handed his last copy of his Bible to the guy that chopped his head off. Uh, we don't have independent corroboration of that, but, but, but the, that's sort of Protestant lore about this. So obviously, a very sort of unfortunate uh, beginning for, for Korean-American relations. But what do we make of this? Uh, I want to highlight two things. The first is how this story has been repurposed or reimagined, especially in North Korea. Uh, and then second, to note something that I see both at that time in 1866, and I would argue even to today, the fact that we have a lot of mistaken identity going on here, a lot of confusion on, on, on both sides about who we really are dealing with. So first, the, the, the terms of, of, of repurposing. Uh, the North Koreans seized on this moment and have made it the beginning point of Korean-American relations. And, and because of the fact that resisting the United States is such an important part of, of the North Korean imagination. You, you can imagine how significant this is. And no less august a figure than, than the great leader himself, Kim Il-sung, you know, essentially declared, our relations began with the General Sherman. This is where it began. But even above and beyond that, there, there are many uh, North Korean historians that, that argue that the very modern period of, of Korean history begins at this moment. It's, it's not just the beginning of Korean American relations, it's the beginning of the modern period. And so it's, it's really, really important in the North Korean imagination. Uh, one example of this is a multi-volume uh, academic history of North Korea, uh, Joseon Junsa, or the, the history of Korea. The modern section, or the recent history section, of, of which is three volumes, uh, begins, if, if, you, if you open the cover and look on the inside of, of the front cover, begins with this picture of the General Sherman being destroyed. With no need for explanation, the assumption is everyone in North Korea knows exactly what this is and, and, and how important this is. Uh, and so that's one, one, one way in which uh, this has sort of been reimagined and repurposed. It's not just one of a series of, of interesting and sometimes unfortunate interactions between Koreans and outsiders. It is the most important one, the starting point. But also in North Korean historiography, you see an interesting shift. In the 1950s and the early 1960s, accounts of the General Sherman credit the Korean people, the masses, uh, the, the oppressed masses, uh, of, of rising up as one together and destroying this, this American invader. But starting in the late 1960s, you start to see that out of this masses of, of Korean people emerges a leader, a guy by the name of Kim Ung u who just so happens to be the great-grandfather Kim Il-sung. Uh, and so suddenly you, you learn that the Kim family have been resisting the Americans from the very first moment the Americans showed up in North Korea. Uh, now, naturally, there is, there is zero independent corroborating evidence to support this claim, and even the North Koreans themselves didn't make this claim in the, in the 1950s. This is obviously a part of the expanding cult of Kim Il-sung uh, that, that, that expands in the 60s and beyond. Uh, but, but it's become central, again, to, to the, the, this narrative in North Korea, that it's not just the North Korean people, it's their great leader, uh, who is the ancestor of the great leader, uh, Kim Il-sung. Uh, 
And, and, you, and you see Kim Il Moo depicted in all sorts of different ways in, 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 in North Korean historical sources and imagination and so on. Uh, and in fact, you can go uh, to the place on the Taedong River where, where the General Sherman was destroyed, and there's this huge stone monument uh, sort of commemorating or memorializing this. And you can see outlined there, the, you know, giving Kim Il Moo the, the credit for all of this. Uh, and like any you know, historical monument, uh, it's a place where kids can go and they can learn about themselves and they can learn about their past and learn about their history and learn about who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Uh, and obviously, in the North Korean narrative, it's very clear the good guys are the Koreans and particularly the Kims as leaders of the Koreans and the bad guys are the Americans. And this has been a consistent feature of North Korean politics and culture from the beginning of North Korea, uh, arguably, to today. And, and, and uh, the, you know, North Korea today is filled with all sorts of cultural manifestations of the United States as the enemy, uh, something that which you know, everyone, young and old, should struggle against. Uh, it's interesting to note that at the same spot where the General Sherman was destroyed was where the North Koreans decided to uh, house the USS Pueblo, uh, a Navy spy ship that they seized about a century after the destruction of the General Sherman in, in, in 1968. And, and for many, many years, it was, it was docked right next to the General Sherman Monument. And you could go as a tourist and hear all about uh, American imperialism and heroic Korean resistance. And you get a sense of, of how these two incidents a century apart were linked in the North Korean imagination. Anytime the Americans show up with their terrible ships, we're there ready to, to take them on. Uh, and in some cases, as in this historical comic book, they're, they're literally linked. You, know, you, you have them side by side on the same page. Uh, you know, the General Sherman going down on the left, the sad Pueblo being captured on the right. Uh, I will note that history is always changing, and, and this has changed too. Uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, North Korea opened up a new uh, fatherland war museum, and they decided to tow the Pueblo to be just outside of that, so it's no longer right next to the General Sherman. And you can see here, here's Kim Jong-un coming at, at the sort of the inaugural opening of this new museum, and there, there's the Pueblo behind him. And it'll be interesting to see that now that they've physically separated the two uh, events, whether intellectually or conceptually that separation will, will, will continue in the future or not. Uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but the other issue, I think, is really interesting one of, of what I call mistaken identities. It's very clear, that if you read the historical record on the Korean side, that they weren't 100% clear who they were dealing with with this ship. Uh, they received some inquiries after it from China. What happened here? We heard, we heard an American ship was destroyed. And in one report, the Koreans write back and say, we don't, we don't know anything about an American ship, but there was a British ship that, that yes, it was, it, it was destroyed. Uh, and there was another account where, where, where the Koreans are communicating with, with another power, and, and they say, you know, there was a French ship, uh, but, but, but you know, it wasn't clear at all initially that they were dealing here with uh, was, was the United States, and, and with good reason. But ultimately, it was, the United States was the only power that, that uh, continued to follow up and say, what happened here? Uh, we, we want an accounting. We want an explanation. And so increasingly, it becomes associated with the United States as, as, as time wears on. But there also was confusion on the part, I would argue, of the Americans. And this is not in terms of national identity. They, they, they assume this was, this was Korea and Koreans doing this. But it is more a confusion over you know, who are the real pirates here. Uh, now, the, the, from a Korean perspective, obviously the pirates are the General Sherman. I, I mean, minimum, they're smugglers, right? They're, they're sailing up illegally and trying to trade when they're not allowed to. But if any of these Korean accounts of them leaving the ship and going to shore and raping women and attacking people and stealing things are true, then that's you know, pirate behavior. And, and so there are many uh, that, that would say, absolutely, it's, 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 the, it's the Americans that are the, the pirates. But the Americans say, of course, we're not pirates. Uh, you know, that, that, that's inconceivable. And so there, there must be some sort of misunderstanding here. And I, I love this quotation from the then American minister to China, Frederick Lowe, who was essentially saying that uh, you know, to ensure peace in the future, the people must be better informed of the purpose of foreigners. They must be taught that merchants are engaged in trade, which cannot but be beneficial to both native and foreigner and that missionaries are engaged in no political plots or intrigues against the government. You know, if you only understood our good intentions and, and, and the, the mutual benefit that you would get from more interaction with us, then you wouldn't resist us the, the way that you're resisting. And I dare say I note echoes of this uh, even to this day, that, that, that when uh, American friends of mine see protests in South Korea, whether they're protests about the American military presence in South Korea or whether they're protesting uh, a, a then proposed Ameri uh, free trade agreement between Korea and the United States, I hear many Americans say, well, the Koreans just don't get it. They don't understand how good free trade is for everyone, or they don't understand all the things that we've done and sacrificed for, for, for Korea in the past. And only if they understood these things, then they wouldn't be marching in the streets and protesting. Uh, as, as if Koreans are incapable of coming to their own conclusions about these events that, that, that might be a bit different from, from, from the American one. Uh, but above and beyond that, 
again, the Koreans are, are convinced. The pirates are the General Sherman. And the North Koreans love it. Uh, these North Korean comic books, you know, complete with, with you know, eye patches, with free-flowing grog. I mean, all, all the sort of stereotypes we have about pirates, the North Koreans say, yeah, that, 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 that was these guys. Um, but it's interesting to note that if you look at the American media at the time, the pirate label is not assumed to be the General Sherman. It's assumed to be the Koreans. Uh, and part of this is because of this epidemic of, of sort of 19th century fake news. I mean, there were some stories about the General Sherman that came out that simply weren't true, like this one. is that the American steamer General Sherman was captured by pirates on the river leading to Peking, uh, wrong country. Uh, her crew was tied to the masts and, and, and uh, the crew was burned. Or this one that talks about uh, how uh, the crew were, were paraded around in cages and then one escaped and told the story. I mean, none, none of this actually happened. Uh, and yet, American newspapers are reporting this as, as, as actual, actual fact. And so because in part of, of, of this kind of fake news, uh, but also in part because of American assumptions about the hierarchy of culture and civilization and, and, and so on, uh, it became increasingly uh, prevalent in, in the American imagination, oops, to say the pirates were the Koreans who attacked this ship. And then, it, and then it was sort of expanded. Not only were, in this particular incident, Koreans the pirates. Koreans have always been pirates. That's just who they are. That's, that's part of their identity. And, and I think really telling is, is this New York Times piece uh, that says that as these pirates of Korea for a long time have been guilty of a series of similar cruelties against uh, the seafaring people of other nations, we've got to do something about this. And, and the ending line of this quotation, the savages want a thrashing. It should be a right hearty one. And I sort of scratch my head about this because I have poured through the historical record about shipwrecks, about other encounters between not only Americans and Koreans, but, but also British, French, other Europeans. And the General Sherman is definitely the exception. The rule is what happened to the, the four crewmen of the, of, of the two brothers or the surprise. The rule is if people showed up in Korea, they were generously treated and then and escorted out of the country. Uh, but yet suddenly in the American imagination, the Koreans have been transformed into pirates that, that attack and destroy every ship that appears on its shore. And, and I'm not alone in, in sort of concluding this. Uh, the British uh, newspaper, the, the Pall Mall Gazette, sort of said the same thing. They said, you know, wait a minute, let's, let's look at this and, and realize that, you know, based on any evidence we have, the Koreans don't do this. This is not typically what they do. And so then the question is, well, well then how do we get to this idea that, that the New York Times said that, you know, the Koreans do this all the time and, and, and these savages deserve a hearty uh, thrashing? Uh, my only explanation for this is that there were also in the American media at the time numerous reports about piracy in other parts of Asia, on the coast of China, a handful of ones in Japan, one very well-known incident uh, that happened just before the General Sherman in Taiwan, where some uh, aborigines in Taiwan attacked an, uh, some shipwrecked Americans and killed them and so on. And so this is essentially Americans uh, confusing different groups of Asians and assuming, well, if it's true in China or Taiwan, it must be true in Korea as well. We're not really going to distinguish between these different folks. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, real case of mistaken identity. Now, we might think that in our enlightened age of instant access to information that, that, that you know, this doesn't happen anymore, right? That, that you know, Americans know precisely who they're dealing with. Uh, sadly, Jimmy Kimmel is here to tell us otherwise. So let's, let's take a quick look. Oops. believe that North Korea's nuclear program is a critical threat to the United States. What I wonder is how many Americans even know where North Korea is. So we went out at the Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> this is what we are. <laughs> Do you think the United States should consider military action against North Korea? I would say yes. And uh, where does that be in North Korea? Um, and, and what, as far as on the map? Um, I don't know. I'm horrible at geography. Okay, yes. Up here there you have it. Uh, now, obviously, Jimmy Kimmel is going to cherry pick the, the humorous ones. He's, he's not going to highlight people that actually know where North Korea is. But sadly, a New York Times poll conducted last year indicates that this isn't that far off. A survey of 
over 1,700 American adults, and they asked them to pinpoint the location of North Korea on a map. And this is where they put it, all over Asia. Uh, interestingly, the closer to the actual location of North Korea the respondent put his or her guess, the more likely they were to favor a diplomatic solution to the North Korean nuclear weapons crisis rather than a military solution. Uh, and so very clearly, the more that you actually know about a place and the more you can see them as actual real flesh and blood human beings, uh, that that influences the way that, that, that you uh, determine the proper policy. Uh, but when you have mistaken identity, when you don't really know who you're talking about, it's easier to imagine that the, the, the correct solution is, is a military one. All right, second story, which is actually two stories, uh, which is what happens five years later. Uh, the American story is of the Low Rogers Expedition, uh, basically an expedition of the Asiatic Squadron, uh, five gunboats accompanied by a number of sailors and about 1,200 Marines, sailing to Korea, hoping to get answers, what happened to the General Sherman, we really want to know, but also to get a treaty, uh, a minimum a treaty that would guarantee the, the, the good treatment of shipwrecked sailors, at maximum, a treaty of, of amity and commerce, a treaty that would open up Korea to the outside world. And the American story more or less goes that, uh, so, so this, this peaceful mission sailed to Korea. It was attacked without any provocation. It was fired upon. And so it had to do what any civilized power would do. It had to return fire. It had to, to show Korea that you couldn't just simply attack us with, without any provocation. But ultimately, had to go home empty-handed. It didn't get any answers. It didn't get a treaty. The Korean story, as, as I already indicated, has, has a set of different names. Sometimes it's Shimin Yangyo, the Western Disturbance of 1871. Sometimes it's the first Korean-American War. It assumes that the Americans were coming from the beginning to invade, to attack. They, 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 they had no other uh, real motive. Uh, and therefore, the highlight is on the heroic Korean resistance to, to this. Uh, and, then, and then saying, it was our resistance that forced the Koreans to retreat. Now, there are actually elements of truth to both of these stories. Uh, they, they, they kind of overlap in some interesting ways. Uh, but to tell the story in, in, in a little bit of detail, uh, it was led by Frederick Lowe, the, the American minister in China, the, the, you know, the ambassador to China. John Rogers, a, a, a storied admiral at this point, was, was commanding the uh, Asiatic squadron. And, and again, a, a company of sailors and about 1,200 Marines. Uh, they start, uh, as, as they go, they are very clearly seeking to model their mission after a successful American diplomatic overture that happened about 20 years before. Uh, Commodore Perry's famous black ships that, that sailed into Edo Bay and issued an ultimatum to Tokugawa Japan. You need to open up to the outside world or else. And Tokugawa Japan said, okay, we'll open up to the outside world. And very clearly, even down to the number of warships, uh, it was the same, the approach was the same, and, and both Lowe and Rogers writing in their own diary say, we're, we're gonna do exactly what Perry did. You know, we're, we're gonna open up Korea. Uh, they start in Nagasaki in Japan, and they sail up the uh, western coast of Korea, approaching Seoul, the, the, the Korean capital. Uh, but, but here they, they, they confront an interesting obstacle, uh, and that is Kangwa Island. This is an island off of the western coast of Korea, an island that's very important in the Korean imagination, not only in, in this modern period, but, but in, in earlier centuries as well. And to get to Seoul, you essentially have to sail up this really narrow strait between Kangwa Island and the mainland. Uh, and naturally, because of that, uh, this is well defended. There, there were Korean fortifications uh, that, that you can see sort of remnants or, or, or uh, re remodeled or rebuilt ones uh, there today. Uh, armed with weaponry that was woefully behind the times to be sure, but, but still fortifications with troops and guns and cannons all there to defend against a, a, a potential foreign attack. And, and by the largest of these fortifications was this stone marker that, that very clearly says, don't sail up this way. Uh, that, that, that this is territory that you shouldn't, uh, you, you shouldn't come to. So what the Americans did is they uh, sailed up that way. They, uh, they interacted with a few low-level Korean officials uh, that, that were of, of such low rank that Lowe and Rogers wouldn't meet with them directly, but they let their subordinates talk to them, and, and they had their subordinates tell these low-level officials, we're here on a peaceful diplomatic mission. We're going to send some survey ships up this, up this uh, narrow strait. Don't worry about it. It's not a threat at all. Uh, and the next day, they sailed their survey ships up, and when they got to this critical juncture, the Koreans fired on them, as, as, as you might expect. Uh, the Americans returned fire uh, in the short term and, and killed a number of Koreans, but, but then they retreated to the main flotilla, and uh, they sort of argued back and forth, what do we do now? Uh, Rogers initially said, 
we, sh we should attack and destroy all these fortifications immediately to show our, our strength and our resolve. But then he thought, you know, the tides are not really very uh, favorable right now. Let's wait a few days for the tides to get better. And then, and then Lowe said, well, as long as we're waiting, why don't, we, why don't we wait and see if the Koreans apologize? And if they apologize, then, the, then maybe we, we, we don't have to attack them. But ultimately, there was, uh, according to Lowe and Rogers, there was no apology forthcoming. Uh, and so, so attack they did. Now, I would note that on, on the one hand, had the Koreans not fired on these survey ships in the first place, uh, you wouldn't have had the unfortunate attack that, that followed it. Uh, but on the other hand, it, from my close reading of, of, of both the Korean and the American uh, correspondence and their interactions, it does not appear to me that the Americans were going very far out of their way to avoid the possibility of a conflict. Uh, and again, to me, one of the key elements is, is this, this interaction with these low-level officials that are so low-level you won't even directly meet with them. And, and, and uh, Roger's account indicates that, yeah, we told them we were going to go survey, and basically they didn't say, don't do that. And so we took that as, as permission, as, as an okay. And then we also assume that they will get this, this message up the line of, of command in Korea instantly because we're going to go survey the next day uh, with no sort of wait to confirm or anything like that. It doesn't, I mean, if you're really trying to be cautious and say we want to definitely avoid the possibility of, of a conflict, this doesn't seem like uh, the, the type of behavior you're engaged in. Uh, and I would note that another of the naval commanders on, on one of the ships, uh, Winfield Scott Schley, uh, noted that they, when everyone was thinking about this, they knew that you know, we're coming here to open up Korea through force of arms. And so if Korea says no or Korea doesn't cooperate, we're, you know, that's what we're here for. This, this, this is our purpose. Uh, another naval commander who wasn't at this very uh, mission, but he was at one that tried to approach Korea before and several that tried to approach Korea after, in his own writing simply summed up, you know, this was simply a, a revenge or a reprisal for the General Sherman. You know, that, that's why we were there, what, what was to teach the Koreans a lesson, don't attack our, our merchant ships. Uh, and then ultimately, the, again, this, this question, you know, the Lowe and Rogers say the Koreans never apologized. Uh, well, if you look at, at uh, you know, the close record, uh, here, here's one Korean official writing, and I'm not sure if I'd characterize this as a full-fledged apology, but it certainly is sort of an explanation, you know, saying, we're really sorry this happened, but what do you expect of us? You're, you're sailing in, in our really, really strategically important waters. Um, you would do the same thing if we, if we sailed out the Potomac River, uh, you know, strategic waters of yours. Uh, what else are we supposed to do? And, and, and he even say, you know, we, we deeply regret this. But, but this, this was completely ignored. This is not a real apology. We, we need to go ahead with, with our reprisal. Uh, the Koreans sensed this was coming, and so they sent many more troops to the coastal fortifications, commanded by this guy, Oh Jae Yun, uh, who brought, uh, as, as an indication of his rank, this, this really uh, specialized flag that flew atop the, the, the major fortification. Uh, but, but the Americans, 10 days later, uh, attacked one fortification, uh, they, they bombarded it from the sea and, 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 and scared the Koreans, they ran away and, and then, they, then they landed and took that fortification and destroyed it. They slept overnight and then they marched north and attacked another one and attacked another one. The same sort of uh, pattern of uh, bombarding it from the sea, the Koreans flee, they take it and destroy it. But then you have the biggest fortification, the one uh, that, that is, is, is high up on, on the ridge, well defended, that's where General Oh was, that's where his flag was. And the only way to get to this is to march straight up this really, really steep incline. Uh, but the Americans said, we have to do it. We, we have to take them out. Uh, and so, again, bombarding from gunboats up from the sea, but also artillery on land. They marched up. The first American, uh, uh, Lieutenant McKee, who made it over the parapet in, in, into the fortification, was killed by the Koreans. But more and more Americans came. Uh, and their weapons were better. Uh, they could reload them more quickly. Uh, and, and, and one by one, they killed every Korean in the fort. Uh, ultimately surrounding General Oh and killing him almost last of all. Uh, and in the end, uh, estimates are about 350 Koreans perished in, the, in this conflict, with three Americans dying. So, you know, really, really unequal uh, in, in terms of casualties. Uh, and I can't but feel at least a little sympathy with the Korean who wrote to the Americans after this, uh, you know, basic, basically saying, why did you do this? Uh, what kind of civilized people? Uh, participate in, in, in these types of, of affairs. This was the largest overseas deployment of American military force between the Civil War and the Spanish-American War. Uh, it was hailed in the New York Herald at the time as our little war with the heathen, uh, but I dare say most Americans have forgotten about this. Uh, this asked for a raise of hands. Have you ever heard about this incident before? Anybody? You know, killing 350 Koreans? Uh, it's, it's vanished from the American imagination. Uh, as you might expect, it hasn't vanished from the Korean imagination, both North and South. Uh, and in fact, you can go to uh, 
a museum near the citadel that, that was seized by the Americans. Uh, you know, I showed a picture before, but uh, you know, troops of, of Korean school children go and they learn about this. You know, they, they, they learn about the fact that uh, long, long ago, one of the first encounters between Koreans and Americans was, was not pleasant. Uh, was, was a very one-sided attack on, on our fortifications. Um, I don't want to leave the impression that all South Koreans burn with the flames of anti-American sentiment because that's clearly not the case. Uh, many South Koreans uh, have fond feelings for, for both Americans as individuals and also for American policy. Uh, and, and there have been some interesting moments to attempt at reconciliation. Uh, here's an example where James Wardrop, he's the grandson of one of the American military commanders in this expedition, and Oh Yun Won, the great grandson of, of Oh Jae Yun, the, 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 the Korean general who was killed. They got together in 2000 at the location and basically had a ceremony and said, let's, let's let bygones be bygones, let's, let, let's get past this. Uh, and one interesting sort of coda to this whole story is the story of the flag, the Sujagi, this, this flag that indicated that General Oh was, was in the citadel. Uh, it was seized along with a lot of other things by, by the Americans, and here's a picture of the three American soldiers who, who, who captured the flag. Uh, and it was brought back to the United States, and it was housed in the Naval Museum in Annapolis. And uh, very proudly displayed early on as, as sort of a, a, a trophy of war. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century, it was part of a much larger restoration project. It was kind of fraying and falling apart, and the, and the Americans were, uh, went to great work to, to restore it, uh, to, to preserve it. Uh, but then as the number of artifacts and war trophies sort of pile up, the significance of this particular one diminishes. And so instead of unfurling it on the wall, they, they make it smaller and smaller until ultimately it was rolled up there at the bottom of the shelf. Uh, hardly noticeable, hardly memorable. Uh, now South Korea has been a treaty ally of the United States since 1953. And the South Korean government from time to time would write to the Navy and say, is there any chance we can get our flag back? And we're friends now. Can, can we get over this? And the initial response for, for decades was, that's against naval regulations. Uh, the, their naval regulations said, anything you've seized in battle, you can never give back. Uh, but ultimately, as, as another sort of, of gesture of reconciliation, uh, the, the uh, Naval Museum in Annapolis agreed to loan this flag back to Korea in 2007. Now, if you think that Koreans are ever going to give this back. Uh, I've got some swamp land in Florida I will eagerly sell to you. I mean, the Koreans are never going to let this go. But it was, it, was, uh, it was received with great fanfare. It was flown again atop the same fortification it flew way back in 1871. Uh, and then it was displayed in a museum. Uh, the museum right there where, where, uh, where, where these events took place, uh, where, where I could take a picture of it. But then I went to the uh, Korean Military Museum in Seoul, and there it, there it was, the same flag. And then I went to another museum in Seoul, and there it was. And I started getting confused because I, I, was, I was pretty convinced. I was told that this is the only surviving example of this flag in the world, that all the Korean ones have disappeared. Now I see three. What's going on? And so I, as I tried to track it down and talk to any number of curators and, and come to find that the original one is not displayed anywhere. It's kept in, in, in storage. And these are all replicas. And it raises an interesting question about the tension between you know, uh, authenticity and representation. I mean, d d does it matter if the Sujagi is in Annapolis or Korea if we're not really going to show it? I guess it does. Uh, but but, but uh, you know, these things are a bit murky. Uh, and then one, one quote to this story, just a few months ago, uh, Annapolis was doing some renovations of their museum, and, and they took off a, a display that was on the wall. And lo and behold, behind it, they found a bunch more flags from, from this incident uh, that have been hiding there for, for decades uh, that they didn't even know about. Uh, they're in the process of restoring these. The Korean government has already written to say, uh, by the way, any chance we're going to get these flags back? But uh, how, how this will turn out remains to be seen. It has not been determined. Um, to wrap things up, I highlight these two stories in part because they highlight to me which is something that's been an abiding feature of Korean-American relations from the beginning. And that's what the uh, historian, uh, political scientist, Chae Jong-suk, calls asymmetry. And I think there's asymmetry in at least two ways. There's certainly asymmetry of knowledge. Now, not every Korean is going to know all the ins and outs of details of the General Sherman and, and, and the Low Rogers expedition, but many, many more Koreans are going to know more about this than your typical American. They know more about this than, than, than Americans do. But they also, there's an asymmetry of intensity. They feel more about it. They care more about it. And sometimes they'll, they'll ask their American counterparts, don't you care? Uh, you know, what, what do you feel about the fact that, that you know, this, this is the unfortunate way that our relations began? And, and there's an interesting way to try to get, well, how, how do we as Americans account for this? And the only way that I can account for this is, is to sort of situate these events in the larger global context of, of what the United States has been and to some degree still is. And that is a global maritime empire with activities and interests all over the world. 
And so to sum up, uh, I, I think a really interesting example of this is, is again, Winfield Scott Schley, uh, who is one of the commanders of, of uh, one of the officers on board of the ship. He had a 45-year naval career, and then he wrote about it in a book. And he says in the introduction, I went so many places, did so many things, I can only give you the highlights here. But here are the highlights of where he went just in the 10 years before the, uh, the Low Rogers expedition. Uh, he went to Angola. He went to the Cape of Good Hope. He went to Batavia in modern-day Indonesia. He went to Hong Kong. He went to Tokyo or Edo. He went to Singapore. He went to Aden. And if I keep going at this rate, we're going to go here all night. So I'm going to say he went to a bunch of other places. Uh, I mean, the fact is the United States has been involved in, in a variety of places in a variety of, of, of ways that, that you know, Americans would really struggle to keep up with just because there's so many of them. Uh, and, and these weren't just port calls made by a warship. In some cases, there were, there were some real consequences. Uh, at one point, he and his ship uh, were off of, of the city of La Union in, in El Salvador. There was a civil war going on. He and other Marines uh, landed and, and used their weapons to defend the American consulate and some American merchants. At, at one point, having a showdown with, with some rebels that marched up, and they were eye-to-eye, they were -eye, almost ready to fire on them. Uh, and then later, the rebels lost, and the Americans took them and, and said, we, we don't trust the El Salvadoran government to treat them well, and so we're going to move them to Nicaragua. Uh, so, you know, interfering in, in, in the domestic affairs of El Salvador. Uh, a little bit later, they made their way down the coast of South America to the Chincha Islands just off of Peru, which was at that, at that point being used uh, to harvest guano. And all of the workers there that were harvesting it were Chinese, and they were striking. They, they were uh, protesting the conditions that, that, that they were uh, experiencing there. And so Schley and his Marines landed and killed a bunch of the Chinese to restore order. Uh, you know, they're just sort of being the world's policemen. Uh, further down the coast, they encountered a Chilean ship. The Chileans thought they were Spanish, and, and, and Chile, was at, uh, Chile was at war with Spain at the time. And so the, the, uh, here, too, there was almost an international incident, almost a conflict. Uh, before they got to Korea, in Shanghai, they conducted daily gunnery exercises to show the Chinese don't mess with Americans. They transported missionaries back to Tianjin. I mean, all of this is to illustrate that, that, that again, it would be really hard for any American, even if he or she wanted to, to remember all of the ways that the United States has been involved in the world, and some, some for good and some for not so good. Uh, and, and it's easy to imagine how then uh, an incident so important uh, to Koreans uh, might not be so important to, to Americans. And I'm, I, I was really struck by a, a book I read just a, a, a month ago, uh, Susie Hansen's book, Notes on a Foreign Country. Uh, initially, you, you get the impression the foreign country is, is about Turkey, where, where she's spending time uh, uh, living and, and reporting and writing. But in reality, the foreign country is the United States. She's realizing that she, as an Ivy League educated journalist, had no idea how much of the rest of the world sees the United States, how, how much of the rest of the world understands how US policy and US actions have influenced what's happened in Turkey and in Greece and in Egypt and in Iraq and other places. And she has this really interesting exchange with, with, with a gentleman from Iraq, where um, she says that, uh, the Iraqi man I met in Istanbul in 2012 said to me, your country had so much to do with what Iraq was like in the 80s and 90s. We know so much about you, and you don't know anything about my country at all. And then she, she re recounts her, her initial uh, mental reaction to this, which was, why would Americans know anything about life in Iraq, I thought. I still had no control over these reflexes. What I meant was, why would it be necessary? Why would they bother? You were just one country of many. That was it. That was the, that, this was the gulf. This was the distance between us. The imbalance of power between uh, people and nations was violent even in the absence of violence. Uh, and, and I think this is, again, something that we see 100 plus years ago in Korean-American relations, and sadly we see all too often in relations between the United States and many parts of the world today. And to show just an echo of this today, uh, not too long ago, South uh, Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham recounted some conversations he had with President Trump about the current Korean crisis in which he's quoting Trump to say, if there's going to be a war to stop Kim Jong-un, it'll be over there. If thousands die, they're going to die over there. They're not going to die here. And this is what he's told me in my face. And Graham says this not to criticize Trump, but to essentially agree with him. He says, and that may be provocative, but not really. When you're the president of the United States, where does your allegiance lie to the people of the United States? And so if the people over there die, that's, that's an unfortunate consequence not really appreciating the role the United States has played in, in all the lead up to, to this uh, conflict in the first place. And so I'll leave you with the words of Kim Yong Hyun, a, a, a Dongguk University professor, talking about this and saying that you know, South Koreans of today, an ally of the United States, think that Trump is too explicit about placing US interests first without considering South Korea's position in dealing with North Korea. 
the overall perception is not friendly or positive. Uh, and so I, I think that, that studying the past in many cases is really important because as Mark Twain famously once said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And I can hear nothing but rhymes when, when I see the events of the past and, 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 and the events of today. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I think that one of the biggest things is, is to either get out in the world and interact with people from other places, or, or if you have a chance to interact with people from other places even here, and ask them, how do you see the United States in its role? And, and I don't want to say that, that, that you know, the, the, the non-Americans are always right, uh, because history is messy, and, and, and people remember things in, in different ways. Uh, but I think it's really important to start with, well, how do you understand the history of our mutual interactions? Uh, and in many cases, like, like, like uh, Susie Hansen discovered, you know, it's, it's really eye-opening. You know, she, she had no idea that, that people in Greece and people in Turkey you know, credit the United States with, with helping uh, engineer coups and, and prop up authoritarian dictatorships. And she said, I'm supposed to be educated, I'm supposed to know this stuff, but I didn't. Uh, and so I, th I think it's important for, for any and all Americans to, to you know, try to think globally and, and interact with people that, that have different views and, 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 and different perceptions about these things. Yes? Um, how do you think the meeting with Trump and Kim will go <laughs> that, 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 That's a really good question, and, and, and I wish I could say with any certainty. I, I, I will say that um, Trump has been famous for breaking all the rules. Uh, and, and so while all, all of the diplomats, that, you know, my, my friends in D.C. will all say, you can't expect to have any real progress or breakthrough in a summit meeting unless you have extensive preparations beforehand done by all sorts of underlings. Uh, there are no underlings in, in the State Department to do this. Uh, you know, as far as we can tell, Trump is, is more or less going to wing it. But at the same time, he breaks all the rules. And, and so who knows uh, what he might come away with. I'm glad the meeting is happening. Uh, not least because, at, at minimum, it means the likelihood of a war is, 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 not, is much lower, at least while they're talking. But also because, and I, and, and I said this at lunch, uh, I really think that, that uh, uh, an important first step is to have Americans start regarding North Korea as, you know, we, don't, we don't have to like them, we don't have to respect them, but, but treat them like a, a, just another normal country. Uh, just like we treat almost every other country in the world. Uh, and the fact that Trump and Kim Jong-un would, 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 would be a, a big step in that direction. So I, I, I like both of those things. Whether we'll see any real breakthrough in terms of, of the North Korean nuclear weapons program, who, who can say? Yes? So what would you primarily attribute uh, America's sort of lack of self-awareness and maybe its complacency uh, in regards to historical I mean, I, I would say at least two things. Part, part of it is, is what I tried to allude to with, with Schley, is just there's so much uh, that, that you know, it would be hard for anyone to, to sort of wrap their heads around all the different ways in which the United States has, has, has interacted with, with, with other peoples. Uh, but I also think the, the, the American, strong American sense of exceptionalism, of, of you know, a mission in the world, a manifest destiny, whatever you want to call it, uh, means that, that just like uh, uh, Minister Lowe when, he, when he's talking about that, you know, the people in Asia just need to learn what we really are and what we really want, then, then of course they'll, they'll agree with us. It's, a, it's this idea that it's inconceivable that anyone would disagree with our well-intentioned efforts in the world. Uh, and obviously in some cases it, it is conceivable. Uh, and, and, and the more we get past that, I think the better. Mm -hmm. you know, would you say, uh, just a few, a gen General statements about um, North Korea's relationship to China, and if China enjoys more leverage, uh, and if, if so, then do we enjoy some, some kind of uh, leverage by proxy mm. in the future? 
I mean, this has been an abiding feature in, in American media and, and also bipartisan statements. I mean, you have both Republicans and Democrats saying, you know, China holds the key, China has the leverage of the power over North Korea. I think all that is, is, is dramatically overstated. Uh, the, the North Korea and China have had difficult relations almost since the beginning. Uh, and, and that North Korea fears China almost as much as it fears the United States. Not quite, but, but, but almost. Uh, and, and North Korea has repeatedly uh, over, the, over the years, even over the decades, demonstrated that you know, they don't care what China thinks or what China wants if, if it doesn't coincide with what they want. Uh, now, I will note that some credit this, this diplomatic breakthrough, the fact that Kim Jong-un is, is agreeing to meet with Moon Jae-in, the South Korean president. He's traveled to, to Beijing to meet with Xi Jinping. He's, he's hopefully going to meet with Trump. Some of them, uh, some give credit to the fact that China, for the first time, really started to enforce international sanctions on North Korea. Uh, and if that's true, then yes, China does have some leverage. Uh, but I would say in general, not nearly as much as, as we often think or, or, or assume. Uh, that that uh, you know, North Koreans can think in terms of short-term interests and long-term interests just like anyone else. And, and one of their biggest long-term concerns is, what do we do with this behemoth on our, on our border? Uh, and, and, and how do we manage those relations? Oh, may I follow up? Is it true that um, North Korea gets a lot of their energy needs, or, or, and also trade in general from China? Yeah, China's by far North Korea's largest trading partner, and, 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 <coughs> and it gets a lot of the energy from it. And, and, and again, in the past, China has, in, in many cases, signed on to UN resolutions and other declarations of, of the intent of, of imposing <coughs> international sanctions on, on North Korea, but most agree that they haven't really enforced them until this last year. And this last year, they, they have enforced them more than, than they've ever done before. Yes? Um, I feel like the summit maybe come, uh, coming up with like um, the Korean South Korean president and also maybe with Trump um, <coughs> with um, uh, Kim Jong Un. How would, how likely would you say there's um, what similarities or differences would there be with like the sunshine policy that was implemented um, during the Kim Dae Jung presidency or like what kind of what would we expect to be similar? What would we expect to be different? During the so I, I think that South Korean President Moon Jae In would love to revisit sunshine and some jokingly call it moonshine based on his name. Um, the challenge to that is I, I believe that Trump firmly believes that the only reason that North Korea is coming to the bargaining table is because of what tr Trump calls maximum pressure. Uh, it's this regime of, of ever-growing ever sanctions plus the ever-present threat of, of, of an attack. And so Trump will be very reluctant, at least in the short term, to sign on to any initiative uh, started by Moon that, that would break through those sanctions. And so if Moon can figure out ways to engage North Korea that doesn't help prop up the North Korean economy, then, then those are possible. But if he wants to, say, reopen the Gaesung Industrial Zone, uh, I, I think there'll be a, a really big break between South Korea and the United States on that. And, and it'd be hard to know what, what, what direction things would go. Yes? Yeah, so No, not nearly as much. Uh, in, in a typical South Korean textbook about this period, they will list a, a variety of, of incidents. Uh, some of them are American, some are German, some are French, and the General Sherman is just one among many. And, and so they acknowledge it, to be sure, but they don't give it the sort of pride of place that the North Koreans do, where the North Koreans say, you know, this, this is where it all began. This is, this is the critical starting moment. I, I, to me, this, this goes back to this American sense of exceptionalism, of mission in the world. And, and, and because of this sense, there are certain states or actors that, that the United States feels are just completely beyond the pale. And so therefore, they don't deserve to have normal diplomatic relations. And, and you know, Cuba, for a long time, is another example of that, I think. Um, my take, of, of, of course, is I, I think we should treat pretty much any nation state as, as within the pale. Uh, you know, the United States can have relations with really autocratic places like Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, I, so I think North Korea should you know, be included on that list. Will we see future summit meetings? Uh, I, I think in part it depends on what happens at this one. Uh, but, but I'm hopeful that, that this will achieve a breakthrough just in the sense that, that Americans can start to think about North Korea as, yes, they're, they're, they're not like Americans. They don't have the same values. And there are all sorts of things going on in North Korea that Americans wish wouldn't happen. Uh, 
But that doesn't mean that you just simply ignore them and that, that you don't have any sort of, of, of normal diplomatic relations with them or interactions with them. Would you say that the General Chairman was also the starting point for the United States uh, as far as its view towards Korea? Yes. You know that at the time, um, Secretary of State William Seward saw the United States as an expanding nation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that its capital far beyond Mexico. So would you say that this is the starting point? I mean, more or less. There actually was a congressional re resolution a couple of decades before the General Sherman uh, where, where a congressman by the name of Zadok Pratt uh, said, you know, the United States should open up relations with Korea. But, but then there was no action taken on that. And, and, and then the Civil War happened, and, and you know, the U.S. was obviously distracted with other things. But yeah, I, I, I think for the Americans, the General Sherman starts to put Korea back on the map, uh, back on, on, on the list of places that Americans are interested in. And, and again, the, you know, the British lost a couple of citizens in, in, in that attack too, but they, they showed no interest in following up or, or getting any sort of answer or redress. The Chinese lost 20, and they showed no interest. It's only the Americans that, that, that showed, showed interest. Uh, and, and, and that's in part because of you know, the American desire to make the world safe for maritime trade. Uh, and, and increasingly, you, you see in the American writings about this, this sort of bewildered resentment. That, you know, Korea is like the last place on Earth that doesn't have normal trade relations with the United States and other major powers. You know, how can this be? Uh, we have to change the state of affairs. And I think, yeah, I think most of that really does start with, with the general chart. Any other questions? Uh, way in the back. Yeah. Um, how do you think China would feel if the U.S. opened up a trade dialogue between Korea? I think China would welcome it. Uh, I, I think China really doesn't want a North Korean collapse or a war on the peninsula. And so to the extent that that would help avoid both of those outcomes, I, I, I think China would welcome it. Uh, in the long term, what, what Chinese policymakers have made pretty clear is, is they say they favor <laughs> Korean unification peacefully, but in their scenario, it's a unification that does not include the United States. Uh, and, and so therefore, you wouldn't have a unified Korea with American troops maybe up on the Yalu River right, right by the Chinese border. But if they can see things that will stabilize things and reduce the likelihood of war, that, in general, I think Chinese would support that. OK, any other? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all. And thank you very much for coming.